All About Animals Radio. We are a volunteer-run community radio station dedicated to all animals and those who advocate for them. My name is Nikita Dewan as one of the hosts, and I'm really excited to have Singita Iyer as our guest on All About Elephants. Ms. Iyer is an author, National Geographic explorer, broadcast journalist, biologist, and documentary filmmaker. She's known for her advocacy on specifically elephants and is a founding executive director of the Voice for Asian Elephant Society. Thank you so much for joining today, Ms. Iyer. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for bringing me on and thanks for all the wonderful work that you do as well. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate it. Um, can you just start by telling us about your background and how you became interested in animal welfare? Right. So I've always been a nature and animal lover. And uh, as you clearly alluded, I am a biologist. And so I've always had an affinity towards animals, in particular elephants, because I was born and raised in Kerala, India. And my grandparents used to take me to this amazing temple in Palakkad. Uh, and I fell in love with this bull elephant with whom my grandparents used to just leave me to play. And he was shackled in that temple. Uh, but just the few moments that the two of us were together, it was just really special for him and for me. And one day I asked my grandmother, uh, how come this elephant is, is, has got those shackles on his legs and mm -hmm. I don't have shackles? And my grandma went out and my smart grandma bought anklets and she put it on my legs and she said, now you have it. You know, in India, we get the silver pile, as we call it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, then I asked my grandma, how come, you know, they, that ch the chain for this elephant is tied together and not mine. And my grandma said, oh, my goodness, I like I was blown away because she was telling me the story when. I turned a teenager. And the reason I'm sharing that story is because my destiny had been carved out when I was a three-year-old child. And this is something I've described in my book uh, that you had mentioned earlier. But um, yeah, so my, I've always been passionate about animals uh, ever since my, you know, my three-year-old, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, innocent mind I had always... Um, had me connected and even when I was growing up in Kerala I would go into farmland and steal mangoes and all these kinds of things it was fun but um, yeah that's how I've always been in love with nature and animals and wildlife. No wow it seems that you know you've been able to grow up with that compassion at such an early age and really feel that connection to animals um, and just yeah. evaluating how we treat them in comparison to ourselves. So I think that's very cool. And you mentioned that you grew up in Kerala, which is famous, not famous, but they do have religious festivals which involve elephants. And you're also the director and producer of Gods and Shackles, which is an expose documentary about Kerala's temple elephants. And, you know, it's very successful. It was nominated at the UN General Assembly and has over 13 international film awards. Can you just start by telling us about the documentary? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in 2013, when I was visiting Kerala, uh, and it was for my father's death anniversary that I had actually traveled to India and, uh, you know, a, a bunch of synchronistic, synchronistic events unfolded. And I ended up returning to these Kerala temples. But by this time, I mean, I'd been a videographer, so I always carry my camera with me wherever I go. And so I was absolutely devastated to see the plight of these beautiful animals. Many elephants had massive tumors on their hips. Some of them were blind, tears flowing down their face, blood and pus oozing out of their ankles because chains were cutting into their flesh. And I just, and it was, it was just ravaging. It was just soul ravaging. And I try to control my emotions, but I voraciously gathered some 25 hours of footage. And after I returned to Toronto, which is my adopted home, I've been living here for 35 years. I, I thought to myself, my goodness, I got to do something with these, with, you know, with the footage that I've gathered. So I spoke with my media colleagues and they said, well, why don't you 
produce a documentary. I'm like, well, I'm a broadcaster, mm-hmm. broadcast reporter, broadcast journalist. I don't have any documentary production experience. They said, well, you make you produce two, three minute segments for the newscast. The documentary would be maybe, you know, three times 10, that is 30 or six times 10. I'm sorry, 60 times, six times 10, that is, um, you know, 60 minutes, like however long you want to produce, um, you know, those short segments and patch them all together. That really made sense to me. And they said launch. And then the question was, oh, I didn't have the money. And then my colleague said, well, launch a crowdsourcing campaign, which I did. And again, I didn't have any experience in raising money. But as they say, the rest is history. And I followed my heart's calling. And it ended up becoming this film called Gods and Shackles. People were desperate to talk about the plight of elephants. Believe it or not, even in Kerala, even the festival organizers I mean, there's one organizer who actually has been interviewed in my film. His name is uh, C.A. Manon, who has since died. But he himself, like almost uh, almost diabolic or, you know, it's like completely um, dichotomous way of thinking. On the one hand, he was supporting, you know, and this exploitation and perpetrating the suffering of elephants. But on the other hand, he himself admitted that it's not good for elephants, that it's hurting them. And so you just, you, you know, I, I was like, okay, I got to expose this. And things came into my, you know, into my pathway and people started contacting me. And I, you know, I returned to Kerala then to the mother of all festivals, Trishur Puram. And that, if, if <laughs> I mean, that's like the worst abomination of its kind. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, my goodness, and that by this time I had a camera crew, so I took them and, you know, we ended up producing this film, Gods and Shackles. And because it is an epic film uh, and this expose has never been produced in the manner that I have because it's extremely balanced. Also, a Hindu priest, he came forward and he talked to me. I said, there's nothing to do with are Hindu scriptures. There are no Hindu scriptures that even suggest the exploitation of elephants, you know? And so everybody, everything came together. And now the film is available on waterbear.com for free screening. Everybody can watch it. It's actually the world's number one environmental and wildlife uh, streaming platform for advocacy, uh, you know, for advocates and activists and climate activists and animal welfare activists, conservation, et cetera, et cetera. And they have thousands of movies that people can watch, but I'm so honored to have Gods and Shackles Mm -hmm. also showcased in their uh, platform. Yeah, definitely. I think I will definitely link uh, that streaming site so people can go check out the documentary. And you mentioned that these elephants, you know, they have bruises and they're shackled for long times. Can you maybe just paint a picture of what a typical day looks like for a temple elephant in these festivals? I can talk about my beloved Lakshmi. So basically, she would we she would wake up in the morning at like four o'clock. Actually, she would be awakened in the morning, you know, by poking and prodding. Uh, she would, you know, elephants seldom lay down, but you know they probably lay down for about an hour or so because their body cannot withstand the massive organs, so they 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 never lay down because that'll kill them, kill the organs and destroy them. So, but. Usually she's prodded and poked and awakens like a rude awakening of sorts. And then she's taken to this pond where she's bathed and she's, they don't even allow her to, you know, to do her morning, attend her nature's call calls. And they just push her into this filthy pond. And I watched her, which again, I've documented in that film, Gods in Shackles, she walks in and she poops inside because they don't even allow her to tend to her nature's calling. And then you'll see the mahu take her poop and toss it out and bathe her in the same filthy water. It's just disgusting. And they call it bathing, you know. Mm. Anyway, so she, so she comes out and she's supposed to carry her own chain because, of course, the chains are heavy, but it has to be washed. It has to be polished. It's all, you know, to make sure that the temple 
um, devotees think, oh, they take care of the elephants, whereas they really don't. And then they feed her like a handful of just leftover rice. And actually, you know, I mean, it, elephants need a lot of food, right? They consume yeah. about, you know, uh, 300 to 400 pounds of a wide variety of fod fodder. They don't eat boiled rice in the forest, but that's what she's fed. And then she's made to walk uh, to the temple and then she'll do her ritual in the morning, early morning ritual that starts at rituals that start at like five o'clock or 530. She'll go around the, uh, to the temple three times, like take circles. And then she'll wait there for about two hours when they'll feed her just a few palm leaves, of course. But the poor thing is starving because they need a lot. They have voracious appetite. And at 9.30, she has to perform another ritual. And after that, at 1.30, she has to perform another ritual. And in between, she's shackled on this concrete granite floor, which is so horrible for the elephant feet because they're used to lush jungles and marshes. Their foot pad is soft. It's not made for concrete floor. It's made for lush jungles and marshes. And so she's forced to stand there and people will go and take selfies with the elephants mm -hmm. and give him, give the mahout some kind of a tip or whatever. And then in the afternoon, beneath the, hor beneath the scorching sun, uh, melting tar roads, she will return home. And she'll be then standing inside her, in, in the backyard of, you know, wherever she's kept. Right now, she's kept in a dilapidated building. It's horrendous where she's kept right now. Mm -hmm. And then at about 6.30 in the evening, she'll go back again for her ritual. And then there's yet another one at about 8.30. And in between, she'll be shackled in the temple. And then she'll return home. And that's like, she's like enslaved completely, like doing these rituals. I mean, I would really love for these people who claim that elephants are meant to be used in these rituals to show me a single scripture that makes these mm -hmm. suggestions. Like I've been really researching this a lot. And even the priest, as I said, he has completely denied anything of this, this sort. So that's a typical day for you in the life of an elephant. It's pathetic. No, that sounds, that honestly sounds like heartbreaking. And you mentioned a couple of times that like, she can't perform her natural behaviors at all. It seems so restricted. I mean, she can't, you know, even forage for her own food or get adequate exercise. And I can imagine just with the sheer crowds during the bigger festivals, how, um, and like the fireworks, how disturbing that can be to an elephant. Um, and, you know, you often talk about this cruelty and say it's under the disguise or a veil of culture and religion. So I was wondering, have you met like during your campaign and documentary, have you been met with resistance due to the issues, cultural sensitivity? What have been people's uh, reactions to it? And what is the current status of Kerala's use of temple elephants? Yeah, of course. You know, when you listen, change is always resisted in the beginning, right? Nobody wants change because when you change, you have to really completely change your behavior, change your attitude and perspectives. And of course, everybody is dependent on these elephants to make money for themselves. That's what it boils down to. Because when these elephants are in the temples, they receive a lot of donations. And of course, for the upkeep of the temples, they do need money. But there are other ways to raise money for the temples, because there are so many devotees, including myself, like I, I really believe in Hinduism. And I really believe in spirituality in general, all religions have one thing in common, which is to be kind and compassionate towards all of God's creations. Mm -hmm. And ahimsa is the foundation of our Indian culture and belief. Yet everything that's being inflicted upon these poor elephants, these incredibly sensitive and supremely intelligent animals is himsa, that is violence, right? Mm -hmm. So behind the insidious veil of culture and religion, they are minting money, actually, these elephant owners and even temples, right? And so, of course, you know, when, when this kind of an expose hits their pocketbook, they're going to be all out and attack me. So I have been you know, attacked like verbally, 
I've been attacked on social media. I've been cyber bullied. And there are so many even media stories about me being cyber bullied. Mm -hmm. And there are certain factions within. I mean, it's not just in India. It's everywhere around the world. Truth, when it when truth is exposed, people always and, and when you challenge their worldviews and and the way they think you you're always going to get a you know attacked that's just the nature of the beast no pun intended but at the end of the day you got to speak the truth and you have to continue to to uh, you know say the same message it's like marketing right when you see advertisers they keep repeating the same message over and over and over and over again until until it sticks with you and it's going to take a long time and now what has happened ever since the movie has been released is, you know, it has jolted open the um, Pandora box, if you will. And people are awakening to the harsh realities that elephants suffer. So the good thing is the media has been emboldened to speak out after the release of my film. The activists have become more um, you know, brave and courageous because they are like, yeah, we got to speak out, you know, mm. and and so that is really good news. But in terms of progress, well, progress, just as we were tr- hoping to make this, you know, change and finally, eventually phase out, we have this big roadblock. As you would know, you know, the government of India has uh, amended the Wildlife Protection Act mm-hmm. where they're making allowance for religious rituals. And so we just have to wait and see what that will bring uh, in terms of progress. But one of the things that we are seeing in Kerala, Nikita, is that there are so many temples that are now starting to use, you know, um, fake elephant um caricatures and uh, all these various like made of wood and different kinds of stuff. And it's taking uh, yeah, at least about six or seven temples have said, we're not going to use live elephants ever because first of all, it's dangerous for the people because as you said, the fireworks and crackers and overcrowded. I mean, think of Kerala is one of the most populated states. It's a tiny state at the top, at the tip of the uh, tip of uh, southern tip of India, and so um, yeah, so the streets are becoming crowded, the, the, the traffic is congested, and so where how are you going to parade these elephants? Where are you going to parade them? It's dangerous all around. It's a you know it's a safety threat for people. So temples have started realizing that this is not good for them and for their own devotees. And there are many places that are using hologram elephants instead of live elephants. And so there are ways that you can still um, stick with your culture and traditions and not harm and hurt elephants. So it's time for people to change. No, yeah, I was also about to say that I've seen like um, on social media, the holograms for the elephants and also in aquariums quite often. And I I mean, I honestly couldn't tell the difference. I mean, it just seemed um, as real as a live elephant. So um, I think that's so inspiring. I mean, there's always going to be backlash when challenging tradition, I guess. But it's great that there's been progress with the media, the activists and even temples, as you've mentioned. And um, you've also recently released a book called Gods and Shackles. And here you tie your personal experience to your love and fight for the freedom of these captive elephants and in general. So can you just elaborate on what this book is about and what was the inspiration behind it? Yeah, thank you. That that, that was a very personal journey. Gods and Shackles, What Elephants Can Teach Us About Empathy, Resilience, and Freedom is a very personal journey. And in it, I talk about my own journey into the making of this documentary. And as I described a little bit earlier, I was terrified of taking this major step and producing this documentary, but I followed my heart's calling. Synchronicities unfolded, people, situations, circumstances were placed on my path, but most importantly, beautiful elephants were placed on my path. My soul animal, Lakshmi, she really, really cracked open my own 
um, buried emotions. I had a very difficult childhood. You know, I was raised in a very strict Brahmin family and I had no freedom to express myself, to do what I wanted, when I wanted, with my friends, and everything was so restrained. And that is very much similar to how elephants are restrained and, you know, how their freedom is completely uh, suppressed. And so there were so many parallels that came to awareness when I was witnessing the suffering of several elephants. And, you know, India is still a heavy patriarchal society where women Mm -hmm. are suppressed in particular. And so it's women are expected to be subservient, cook and clean, take care of their family, take care of their husband. Of course, things are changing now. Women are speaking out. Uh, But still, that patriarchal tendencies are pervasive across India. So I'm highlighting that. And it's that same attitude to control women is very, very obvious when they're trying to control the elephants. I could draw the parallels right there. Mm -hmm. And it's the justification as well. Like, you know, when my dad was... And God bless my dad is no longer alive. He was uh, and he was in the Indian Army and he really did a lot of great work and he did the best he could with what he knew and had. Mm-hmm. I realize that now, but in between, I was really, really struggling and angry and hurt and all these things were still my mom used to justify and say things like he, he does this because he loves you and the same justification is what Lakshmi Mahut gave me. He said, we want to make sure that she's a good elephant and she behaves well. This is why we keep beating her. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Mm. I, I, the parallels were just too stark. But at the same time, I also noticed the stark paradoxes. On the one hand, they worship, you know, Saraswati and Lakshmi and Durga and Kali Mata. And on the other hand, they still deprive women and they subjugate women and they harass and domestic violence is rampant. Similarly, they actually worship Lord Ganesh on the one hand and on the other hand, they're turning around and harassing Lord Ganesha's embodiment. So the paradoxes are all over, parallels are all over. Mm -hmm. And so that inspired me to write the book because I could write articles as long, as much as I want on any platform, but having a book and documenting these things uh, just leaves behind a better trace. And I also talk a lot about each and every elephant I encountered and how every single elephant taught me some lesson, despite all the suffering that they go through, they are still so forgiving. They are still so compassionate and tolerant. And they taught me, you know, teamwork. They taught me so many things. And as Mm -hmm. you know, elephants are highly intelligent. Their brain size is three times as large as human brain. They are aware. They are so self-aware. So they taught me to you know, be aware, just connect with my prefrontal cortex. And even in Hinduism, we say it's the third eye that Lord Shiva has. And that has a real scientific basis because that's where you have the prefrontal cortex, uh, you know, in between in between your eyes. And so there are all these wonderful religious and spiritual connections I made. So those are some of the things that I've documented in the book. Wow, yeah, I love how you've also been able to highlight the qualities of, as you mentioned, empathy, resilience, freedom, and elephants, because, you know, they're usually there to symbolize strength and why, you know, maybe a justification why they are cultural symbols of India. But as you mentioned, there's still definitely paradoxes um, saying we're protecting them by keeping them captive and really just controlling them. So I think that's um, really beautiful and how your journey and just how your personal journey connects so deeply to elephants and the yeah. parallels you draw between um, yeah. women, just the oppression of women, and also just, I guess, even in nature, how we exploit nature. I've read arguments about how those can be connect interconnected in a way. So I think that's very interesting. And um, 
more than um, temple elephants, you also do a lot of work in human wildlife conflict, I wanted to mention. Uh, so you've, you're the executive founding director of Voice for Asian Elephant Society. Can you tell us just how and why did you start it? What is the organization's mission? Sure. So after the release of my book, Gods and Shackles, I felt like I needed to do something on the ground. You know, the movie definitely created awareness, but what am I going to do after that? Right. And that's why I said, okay, I have to create an organization and actually do something on the ground. Then I realized that there are wild elephants, you know, that are in greater trouble than the captive elephants. So for instance, there are approximately 27,000 wild elephants and there are 2,500 captive elephants. And even though the life of every single elephant, captive and wild matters, the wild elephants were facing graver threats. So Mm -hmm. here's what is happening. Development is rampant. India's population is about to surpass China's next year. And we are going to be at 1.41 billion people in India. And India happens to be the seventh largest country, uh, whereas China is somewhere, I think, the third largest country. So the third largest country has the maximum number of people at this time, but India is going to take over that and it's only the seventh largest country. So you can imagine the competition for space. It's going to only intensify. And so the competition for space, competition for fodder, and I just mentioned development, linear development, railways cutting through the forest, roadways cutting through the forest, electrical wires traveling through the forest and killing elephants. So they're not even safe in their own home. Just imagine, you know, your home being ravaged, completely ransacked. And then, you know, you can't, and no matter where you go, you still see electrical wires and you're like, where am I going to step? You know, what am I, how am I going to live? This is the kind of condition that we have created for these wild elephants. And in particular, the northeastern states of Assam, Bihar, and Arunachal Pradesh, poaching and capture of elephants is also rampant. And it is illegal. Capturing wild elephants is illegal. And so, and those are the elephants that are actually transported to Kerala, for being used in the religious and cultural festivals. So transfer of elephants used to be illegal, but now with the Wildlife Protection Act, it's going to be legalized for religious purposes. So the question remains, I mean, how are they going to monitor the capture of these elephants? How do we know that these are captive elephants that are being transported, right? So there are so many looming questions. And so I created this organization to launch projects on the ground. At this moment, we are using technology to create uh, Elisense device, which will alert the um, train pilots as well as the elephants and uh, hopefully avert as many tragedies. There are more than 1,000 or 1,200, sorry, there are more than 1,200 elephants that were killed in over a decade. Just last uh, numbers, the figures that were released just recently suggest that in the last decade, more than 1,200 elephants have been killed and about 486 of them were killed on India's train tracks alone. Mm -hmm. And the second worst kind of Uh, threat is electrocution because farmers are putting up fencing and um, that is high voltage fencing. So we are also using technology to install solar fencing uh, that are more elephant friendly. And that will not only save elephants, but will also provide some kind of a, you know, respite for the farmers, because let's face it, the farmers who live on the forest fringes, they do so because they cannot afford to live in cities. They're poor majority of them, 55% of our Indian population, they're farmers and they need to find a way to. Mm -hmm. So I had to come to an understanding that if I don't take care or if we don't take care of the people living on the forest fringes, then there's no hope for elephants either. So what we are doing is our vision is to create sustainable human communities and make 
you know, and save the elephants, thus creating a peaceful coexistence. And our mission is to save the endangered Asian elephants by creating corridors for them and by providing subsistence for the people who live uh, in close proximity to the forest. And we have about 12 projects currently underway, like so many projects nonstop, because, you know, given that the the roadways are also traveling, we have to install um, road signs, even though signs were not available. So heavy trucks used to kill elephants. And we are addressing that by in by also cultivating saplings um, mm. in nurseries and then planting it on corridors, making it a safer passage for them. We're also training youth, like it's called Chokidar training, where we have a bunch of youth who are boisterous and who were, you know, rowdy and ch chasing elephants away. Now they're chasing people away and protecting the elephants. So, it, I mean, the changes have been dramatic in West Bengal in particular, uh, in the 3000 square kilometer area that we are working in. There's not been a single elephant death no elephant death in the last 18 months since we have been working. We distribute flashlights. And so we do all these things to protect people. So they are now turning around and protecting elephants. It's like a win-win situation. So we are working in West Bengal, Odisha, and hopefully soon in Kerala as well. And I'm going to be speaking with the Chief Wildlife Warden of Maharashtra State on Wednesday. So we are expanding our projects everywhere. No, yeah, I think that, you know, you've highlighted a really important challenge of just how to balance sustainability and development and how to attend to both the people, the people who are living there and also the elephants. So I think some of your projects, like just like um, you say that, like simple solutions to complex issues, right, like project flashlights. And I think that you've delivered it to over 50, you've delivered over 20,000 sorry, 2000 flashlights to over 50 villages. And that's um, amazing. And there's so much progress. And you also describe habitat fragment fragmentation with an analogy of someone coming and hacking off rooms or blocking off roads, to the grocery stores. Can you just elaborate a bit more on habitat, habitat fragmentation and what those corridors are and why they're important? Yeah, absolutely. So elephants are migratory species. And migration and wandering they are like vagabonds it's in their genes they can't stand in one place you know they can't and they're not supposed to so they wander across vast areas for 16 to 18 hours a day and it the whole forest re areas they used to be contiguous because of this developmental crisis that we are facing, reckless development, mining in particular, which I didn't even address, mining is one of the greatest threats for elephants, especially in Odisha, because 40% of the iron ore for India comes from Odisha. And so their forests are being destroyed for mining. The problem is all of these minerals are also present in core elephant habitats. And when you mine, you are actually digging up the earth and you're, I've, I've visited, I actually went inside a mine. You're, it's almost like there's this big pit and you feel a sense of emptiness because this beautiful, majestic uh, mountain is completely it's like ex they explode it uh, using all kinds of explosives and they crack open the mountain and then they dig in for the minerals it's just a devastating process and that actually not only destroys the homes of elephants but also numerous animals and plants and and so it so what is fragmentation is that the contiguous forests are broken up into small patches because the railways are cutting through. So there's one patch on one side and the other patch on other side. Roadways cutting through, even through those patches, there are roadways cutting through. So the patches become even smaller and smaller. So they're only small forest patches. And if elephants end up remaining in those smaller patches, 
it is going to threaten their survival. It's going to threaten the species survival because what it will promote is inbreeding. It'll prevent them from migrating and from crossing and mixing and mingling with other herds, which is absolutely critical for gene flow. And so, and then of course, when they, when they go through this inbreeding, the babies are born deformed and diseased, and there's going to be numerous death, and that is going to result in, a, in ultimately the collapse of the entire species. And mm-hmm. that's what is happening in, you know, in these areas that have been in these forest regions and these core ecosystems that have been broken up into smaller and smaller and smaller patches. And elephants when they try to migrate between the forest patches, of course, they're faced with all obstacles, as I described, the railways, the roads. So they're they're trying to cross and then a train comes and kills them. They're trying to cross the roads and the truck comes and kills them. And then they're trying to cross through the villages because the villages have started sprouting across between between the forests. Uh, and so when they go through that, of course, villagers are bullying and and, and and taunting them and they're tossing fireballs and torches. So where will these elephants go? You know, they arrived on the planet 80 million years ago. Humans have arrived on the planet just about 200 or 300,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. So within this small fraction of time that our species has been on this planet, we have decimated 83% of the world's wildlife. Can you imagine the kind of destruction we are causing by our actions? And yet we don't really have to be so destructive. We can still make money. We can still live a comfortable lifestyle by you know, embracing and employing sustainable practices. There's no need for any of this. We can still create this contiguous forest we can still make sure that elephants have the corridors that are safe and those are some of the things that we are doing because what we do is we cultivate saplings in our nursery and then plant on across along the corridors so it makes it easier for elephants to cross and uh, yeah we are trying to do a whole bunch of things i mean it's really a lot of work it's just not one it's like you touch one then everything starts becoming clearer and there are one problem after the other after the other there's this trickle down problems that you have to solve until you address the root cause and the root cause of every problem is human behavior yeah definitely and i think that just your organization has come up with really also just effective and simple solutions which just comes with like you said just experimentation and you need to be able to just um use that scientific evidence as well, which I think that, you know, you've been doing and practicing. And um, I also wanted to ask about um, specifically traffic deaths. I know that some of your solutions to that was the cultivation of elephant friendly fodder and the installation of reflective billboards. Um, I was interested in what these solutions um, actually look like and their impact. Yeah. So, the places that we have installed these reflective sign boards, we are seeing that, you know, the truckers are slowing down, but not just because we've installed it. We are also providing awareness programs for these truckers. So it's not just installing these tangible things, but intangible awareness is necessary. And that is something a lot of people don't realize. There's a significant dearth of information across India and yet elephants are our cultural icon and the amount of knowledge they have is just nothing you know and so education is critically important and we are also we have also installed a laser device and what that does is when I mean we plant it at the at the edge of the forest patch so when an elephant is trying to cross from the edge of the forest patch and into the road the the siren beeps and it kind of alerts the truck drivers and slows them down so many people have really really appreciated that particular project as well but the problem is elephants never migrate through one 
pathway, I mean, of course, they do have a migratory pathway set up in their mind, but if they see something that is going to constrict them, then they keep moving on to different areas. So the device now has to be installed almost everywhere, you know, so it, because of the efficacy, people seem to have really liked it and it seems to be working and the villagers are also taking care of it. And that's another thing, right? Because we are employing local communities. So this way, it's also creating uh, economic empowerment and mm. it's making them realize that, hey, if we protect elephants, we can also earn a livelihood and it's going to be a win-win situation. So the kind of animosity that they had for elephants has also now really subsided because of the fact that they're saying, oh, by protecting elephants, we can make money. That's the kind of incentive we need to continue to provide to people because let's face it, you need money to survive. And these poor people, they don't have even, you know, they can't even get by uh, on a daily basis, like food, clothing, shelter, they live in real i mean i've visited some of these places it's just really heartbreaking and so yeah there has to be that we have to strike the right balance and make sure that we provide the people incentives and give them the tools which means education tools as well as other devices like tangible devices so they can take care of themselves their family and at the same time protect the elephants yeah, and I think, you know, I've talked to several people about human wildlife conflict. Um, for example, one girl, she was testing different types of fences for protecting, for holding off elephants from raiding the crops, like bee and chili fences. And she also talked about just maintaining that partnership with the local communities because just having their input and yeah. their contributions in it, it makes it, it makes it more, um, more of a team effort rather than something against it. So I think that's really great. And you also talked about, um, you know, just the lack of education about animals and conservation in India. And you just related to that, you've recently received a National Geographic Award for Education for helping the curriculum for secondary schools in West Bengal. So can you just tell us a bit about that and, the, and elaborate on the role of education and conservation? Yeah, well, I'm so excited about that particular project. It is called Protecting Wildlife by Integrating Systems Thinking Principles in the Secondary Schools of West Bengal. Systems thinking is a really, well, you can call it systems biology, is a very, um, uh, systems biology is an emerging science. And it focuses on the interdependence and interconnections. So it really highlights, if you do this, let us think of the cascading effects that your actions create or whether it's good or bad. So if you did something, for instance, tossed some plastics near the forest and how it impacts the elephants and how it impacts you, how it pollutes the water, how it starts creating zoonotic diseases and other viral infections because it, you know, uh, gutter water, it really fosters all kinds of germs, especially mosquitoes that spread malaria and dengue fever and all these things. Think about the trickle down effect of you tossing the garbage on your own health. And then you see the mm -hmm. elephants who, you know, are consuming this and they're dying, but then think of the value of the elephants. So then, you know, we are screening our short films. So the way this is going to work is we're going to integrate traditional theoretical education and non-traditional films, like short films, right? That's a non-traditional way of educating people. And mm -hmm. then what we'll do, so we'll have the in-class sessions. Then we are going to have uh, nature immersion and slow pedagogy processes, which will help the students and the teachers. So we're basically going to be training the trainers and getting them to experience experience this whole nature immersion and slow pedagogy being in the 
the natural world, embodying the sights and sounds and feelings, and then journaling and reflecting and having rich conversations, and then deriving collective intelligence. And that collective intelligence, it actually shows that, you know, we have included people from all sectors. And when there's inclusivity, then people would be more inclined to embrace anything that we offer. And the thing is, they are going, the teachers are going to be creating the curriculum. All we are going to do is provide them with a blueprint um, because we are, we have created a curriculum uh, with that same topic that I mentioned. And we're going to use elephant as an example. Uh, and we're going to talk about the interdependence. So climate, uh, how elephants help mitigate climate change, how they help with the tree density in the forest and how these trees, especially hardwood trees, they sequester a lot more carbon and how when you chop down the trees, you're basically killing yourself because trees are the lungs of our planet. And so they give us oxygen to breathe and take up the carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere. And so how, whatever you do, how does it impact you, your community, and your surroundings and the entire world, the trickle down effect, the interdependence, the interconnections. And once we provide that blueprint, then we'll have teachers create curriculum and say, okay, there's one issue we will take into focus. For instance, making country liquor. And we just recently saw that elephants came and they slurped away the country liquor and many of them had passed out after consuming the liquor that they had created using the Maua flowers in Odisha, the same thing happens in West Bengal. So, uh, you know, what do you do then to make sure that elephants are not drawn to it? So when you create this country liquor, number one impact elephants uh, are attracted to it because of the smell. Number two, they consume your, your alcohol. And so then there's a human elephant conflict, then there's retaliation, and then there's killing, and then there are tragedies. Look at how it keeps building up. So let us come back now and let's think about a solution to the problem. And you tell me what the solution can be. Mm -hmm. That's how we are going to present this program. And then it's going to take two years. So we just launched this you know, a uh, theoretical uh, program. And in February, uh, we're going to be launching this one-on-one um, -on -one experiential program. And um, in two years time, we're going to have like the entire binder filled with our research, which we'll be sharing with every single school that wants to implement it across West Bengal, across India. And if anybody wants us to go in and share what we did, help them create such curriculum, we'd be more than happy to do it. So this is not something we're going to create and plant it and let it, you know, collect dust on the shelf. We're going to actually implement it and share it. It's going to be available online. We're going to create a website. It's really, really exciting. Wow, no, I love the idea of just immersion in the natural world. I think that can really help people connect with nature and just understand its inherent value, which is very yeah. important at a young age. And also, you mentioned the practical aspect is not just theoretical. I feel like in my school, at least, you know, we just learn about animals it says you know, just an obligatory chapter. It's very separated from the, the rest of the environment. We hardly spend time on it. So I mean, the exploration of those interconnections, as you mentioned, are so important. Um, yeah. It kind of reminded me of the way you said it, the butterfly effect in terms of just the consequences of our actions and how they um, channel through so many different things. And what you mentioned about elephants, how they help mitigate climate change. I mean, there's so much upcoming research about that. Uh, for example, yeah. I learned that uh, annually whales can capture like 33 tons of carbon, which is just amazing. So yeah. I don't know it's just it's so cool and um and I think yeah this education program is really cool and I also wanted to ask you know you've done so many things in so many different fields of animal activism what have been your key challenges so far in your journey wow <laughs> challenges are many well uh, you know it's like you suffer emotionally that mm -hmm. has been one of my greatest challenge um, because when you see animals suffer, it impacts you and it, um, 
really kind of puts you in a very depressive mood. And then, of course, there are times that I have to retreat and take some time out and reflect and meditate and get back on track, which I always do. So dealing with my emotions, the pain and suffering that I that I experience when I see other animals suffer or when I see even a tree being chopped off or when I see even a squirrel being crushed by a car when I'm driving on Toronto streets, like I would stop my car, I would pick a paper or something from the side, I would take the squirrel, put the squirrel aside and bury it. Like this is how I live my life. When I see a caterpillar crossing my pathway in a trail, I'll take it and put it on a tree. Mm. And there are times I ask myself, saying, you know, like, how can you, I mean, I want to save every single creature. I want to save every single, even a microscopic organism that plays a critical role in helping us, you know, keep our web of life intact. This magnificent web of life is made up of such beautiful critters and creatures. And to me, protecting and caring for them. And the other sad part is, you know, the the friction that, you know, people go through, like there are good intentions and well-intended people, but then there are these ego clashes that happen, which is so unnecessary. There's competition for everything. And yet in the natural world, we see nothing but cooperation. Of course, there's this survival of the fittest and there's this significant competition and it's fears, you know, when it comes to the herbivores and carnivores. But overall, the natural world has this propensity to balance itself naturally, you know, and so it's what can we extract from the natural world, cooperation, mutualism, when you see a tree, it's not just a tree, a, the tree is an ecosystem in and of itself. You have the birds that build their nest. You have the critters that live inside. I mean, I actually saw the molting of cicada, the beautiful insects, and I was just blown away by like the, the world, the, the creatures of the earth are so magnificent, magical, and people are not taking the time to experience this magnificence. They're so caught up in their hectic day-to-day -day lives and we are reactive rather than proactive and reflective. And these are some of the things that really concerns me because politics and religion, you know, are interfering with the protection of the nature. They should never be taken there should never be a problem because environment is being used to exploit and politicians are, you know, allowing, for instance, the creation of pipeline and fossil fuel production so they can get politically elected, whereas it's destroying the environment. And so that connection is still not being made. And how can there be a separation of state and the environment, just as they say state and religion, yet everything is so meshed up. And I think we're going through a huge transition, you know, on our planet at this time, as we speak, people mm. are slowly awakening. And I think the more we come together and have these kinds of discussions and the more we implement and the more reflective we are, the more thoughtful we can be and the more productive our lives can be, which would be so deeply fulfilling. And thus we can create a harmonious coexistence. And so my quest is, how can I be part of that? How can I make this happen and play my role in making this happen? So that's, that's the challenge for me. Yeah, exactly. I think it's like, as you said, it's about finding just the beauty in nature and also learning from it. And it's interesting how you connect it to our own morals as well. And I just feel overall, the way you've articulated your journey is very genuine, but just filled with passion and genuine connection with animals. And I'm sure many of our listeners are inspired by your work. So I just wanted to conclude by asking how can the listeners help and support your mission, any funding opportunities, any, um, anything on your website just how can we help 
Yeah, they can log on to www.vfaes.org. That is Voice for Asian Elephant Society, vfaes.org. And you'll see a lot of projects. So if you clicked on www.vfaes.org slash projects, you'll go and see all of the projects. You can donate through our website. We also have an Elephantastic collection on our website so people can check it out. And every penny out of that, after we meet the manufacturing costs, every penny out of that goes towards helping elephants. And the themes are pretty powerful. The first theme is Hati Mere Sati, which means it you know, elephants are my companions. The second theme is together we thrive, which is like talking about unity. And the third one is back off, which I think will resonate with people because elephants are telling us just mind your business and we will mind ours. And so, you know, we have t-shirts, we have, you know, tank tops and, uh, hoodies and all these wonderful items perfect for Christmas shopping and you know it's actually um, a perfect gift for any occasion the colors are mesmerizing and each of these themes comes with a story and the images on the t-shirts have all been taken by me in the Kaziranga National Park and so they have like a personal story attached so you'll read those stories on our website so it's really really unique and I'm so excited about launching that uh, and then of course um in March, I'm going to be speaking at the South by Southwest Festival in Texas. So if people are living, people live in the, living in that area, they can come and join me. And of course, continue to participate in our social media campaigns, sign the petitions that we have. There's just lots of things that people can do to help, you know, and Obviously, not everybody can be in India to carry out the projects that we do. So the best thing they can do is donate and allow us to do the job. And um, collectively only, we can make a difference in the lives of elephants and protect our precious planet. Oh my God, this, the shop sounds so cool and the themes as well. It sounds really exciting. Um, I look forward to it and we'll link everything so people can check your website out. And I, I mean, just thank you so much for joining today. I really appreciate you coming. This conversation, well, I mean, every conversation with you has been really insightful. And yeah, I just wanted to thank you so much. Thank you so much.